We're so grateful for Sister Rachel and for her life Amen. and for her wisdom. And so we're going to ask her if she'll come this morning and share what the Lord's laid upon her heart. Amen. She was sick last week too, and so we had to rearrange things a little bit. Um, but we're glad she's feeling better and willing to share this morning. Eli the priest was a very old man. 
he was probably not well. And she would have taught Samuel to be observant, to look for ways to help him before he even showed that he needed some help. Maybe she would have taught him, if he drops something, just go pick it up and hand it to him. Don't strip away his dignity that says, you dropped that, you must be getting old. But she would have taught him, be so respectful. He's a man of God. He didn't live it. You know, the anointing of the Lord had departed from Eli, but he was still in that office. And she would have taught him to respect the things of God. I believe she focused on helping him to grow up on the inside while he was still very small on the outside. There's a lot of big people running around in this world that are still very small on the inside. And they're hard to get along with because attitudes that were not taken care of when they were young have simply grown up big and ugly with them. But <coughs> even then, she wouldn't have a lot of time with Samuel. Her days were numbered. And it was on purpose. She had set that age. She knew what she was working towards. And so she focused on helping him to have a strong and a brave heart that loved God as much as she did. She instilled within him the beauty of serving the Lord. And you know something? We find that he never turned away from her. What she taught him when he was very young stayed with him for the rest of his life. I did some online research of ancient Jewish, Jewish customs, and it verifies that most children were weaned at the age of three. By that time, they could feed themselves, dress themselves, put themselves to bed, and go to the bathroom independently. And so it's possible that at the age of three, she would be taking him to the temple. I had, or Esther just turned five, and I had to imagine taking her somewhere and just leaving her. She can do all those things for herself, but um, I can't wrap my mind around the fact of doing that. And if your brother should or sister have a very thankful that we're not all gathering our children together and bringing them here for them to be overwhelmed with the task of raising them, because that's our job. But I was so impressed when I thought, if it was at the age of three, how much she prepared him for life. You know, in the rest of his growing up years, she prepared him to be a blessing, not a burden, to an elderly priest. I thought about the many things that we consider to be a nuisance. Um, the many times that our children say, would you just tell me one more story? Would you read one more? Maybe we are so tired. It has been such a long day. And we want the last story we read to be the last story they hear. But I believe that Hannah would have told him one more story. She would have sat there because she would have known. You know, one of these days, I won't be putting him to bed. He'll be doing that for himself. Um, maybe she would have stayed and scratched his back just a little bit longer because she wouldn't be doing that much longer. And then all those questions that begin with why they never seem to run out of. And I, you know, God gave our children that curious nature. They learn and they want to learn. And that's a good thing. And it's a good thing if they ask us those questions because Lord willing, we'll have the wise answers for them. But I don't believe that bothered him. Um, and I was thinking about how our children are all different. Um, Hannah, our oldest, was a listener. She would just kind of absorb information. And I can probably count on both hands a number of times I remember her asking why. And I often said she was a charter member of the Ways and Means Committee because instead of asking why, she would just try to figure it out. And there were times I wish she would ask why <laughs> because we spent time trying to fix what she thought she had fixed. But God gave her that creative nature, so that's good. Um, with Elizabeth and Josiah, they asked why a few more times, but with Esther, it has been almost non-stop. She's like, why, why, why? And she told me, she said, Mommy, I just like the word why. I said, I know that. And I remember one time, it was about the fifth time I was trying to come up with a more creative answer that would satisfy her, and I couldn't. And finally I said, Esther, I don't know. It just is. <laughs> and she was satisfied with that. She said, OK, Mommy. I said, I don't know. I didn't even think of that before. <laughs> And how, you know, Samuel would ask, why, mommy, why do we do this? Why do we do that? And maybe it was about things of the Lord. Why do we worship this way? Why do we bring a sacrifice? Why do we offer it this way? I believe there was that desire in her heart just to let him know. So that those questions were satisfied that he knew. She was making memories as she prepared to keep a promise, a vow that she had made to God. And I believe her perspective was shaped by two things. The brevity of time and the seriousness of her vow. And I don't believe she did it in sorrow. We don't find any sorrow. 
I'm sure like a normal mom, there was that bittersweet knowing, you know, I don't have much longer. I'm going to be saying goodbye soon. And I won't look up and see him. You know, every day, I, I won't fix his meals anymore. And yet her joy was wrapped up in the beauty of not just bringing a sacrifice, but bringing a special little someone to give to the Lord, to be led to the service of the Lord. And that just made her so happy. In verse 22 of chapter 1, she told Elkanah, once he was weaned, that I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. You know, the day came when Hannah folded his, his little pieces of clothing into a bundle. The Bible says she measured out approximately nine tenths of a bushel of flour. She wrapped up a bottle of wine and then she selected three bullocks from the herd. And with Elkanah and then Penina and her children, they went to Shiloh. It was Samuel's first time of being there. And I think it's significant. She took three bullocks. And whether or not that was to make up for the previous three years, I don't know. But if the Jewish tradition is true that at the age of three they were weaned, then it would make sense. But they made the sacrifice. And then she brought him to Eli. And she said, do you remember me? I was here praying. And this is the child that God answered my prayer with. And now I have brought him. And for as long as he lives, he will be lent to the Lord. And Eli blessed her, and then, then they left. But uh, before she left, we have her prayer of worship. And, you know, I was thinking, what would I do if I was bringing my children and I knew it would be a whole year before I would see them again? My response probably wouldn't be one of just extreme and overwhelming joy. Hannah spent a week up at um, Craig's parents' farm last week, and, or last year, sorry. And I missed her so much. She's been my right-hand girl in so many things. And it was just very empty. The house was very dark <coughs> without her being there. And that was just a week. Um, Hannah knew it would be a year. Sandra would be staying there for, you know, the next 12 months. And then at the next time of sacrifice, she would see him again. But we don't see her regretting that she had made that vow in her barrenness. She said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There was overwhelming joy instead of grief. That impressed me so much as I was studying that because as a mom, I can look at my own children and kind of visualize, you know, how would I respond? If I had made that promise myself, would I be wishing that I had it? Would I be wishing maybe I'd moved the age up a little bit? Or or maybe just been satisfied to say, Lord, I'll, I'll raise them for you. And she could have done that probably, but her promise was that he would minister before the Lord in the temple of Shiloh. In chapter 2, verse 11, it says, And Elkanah went to Ramah, to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. You'll notice he ministered unto the Lord. He didn't minister to the priest. His ministry was to God. Praise God. And when we raise our children, we need to do it with the focus. You are ministering to the Lord. No matter what it is, whether it's participating in song service, <clears throat> or in children's church, or memorizing verses, or being diligent in school, it needs to be as unto the Lord. You're not doing it to these people, but it plays the Lord. <clears throat> the next six verses detail just the incredible wickedness of half and Phineas. And then we find again in verse 18. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. And there's such a contrast there. These two young men who had been immersed in the service of the Lord, you know, they might have been born into it because their father was the priest. Yet it was never part of their hearts. And they were so wicked. Even making the sacrifices, it talks about just how ungodly they were. But Samuel. Just a little child. He ministered unto the Lord. He was not clothed like a priest, but he worshiped the Lord in the service of a little priest. He knew that's what God had called him to be. Hannah no doubt knew what Eli's sons were like. If she heard things, she watched them. She taken sacrifices there every year. And we might have hesitated to bring our little ones to be to be raised in that type of environment. I know I would. If I knew my children were going to be going to a camp where maybe the youth leaders were very ungodly and there was just not close supervision and I wasn't going to be there, I wouldn't have 
I guess it's our responsibility to protect them. Uh, but Hannah saw it differently. She didn't give Samuel to Eli's care. She gave him to the Lord. And she prepared him in his most impressionable years to grow up in the service of the Lord, focused on pleasing God, not patterning his life about those who he was with. And he would stay true to God. Amen. You know, his focus was on pleasing God. And I wish there was more detail on exactly how she did that, because it was very effective. Each year, Hannah would visit, and she would bring Samuel a coat that was just a little bit bigger. Uh, now, maybe she patterned that after Penina's children. Maybe she just knew he's going to grow, you know, another inch or whatever. But she made a different coat. And I believe she marveled over how much he had grown, both physically and spiritually. Perhaps he eagerly showed her his duties and how excited he was in worshiping the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, he was all boy. But there was a quiet discipline of his heart, I believe, that set him apart. He absolutely loved his service, and I'm sure it blessed her so much to watch him minister <coughs> with earnestness and sincerity. You know, she watched him. She knew he loved God himself. It wasn't just, well, I do this because Mom at home and I should. He loved God. He shared that love for the Lord. He ministered unto the Lord. And I believe each time she left, a little part of her heart probably stayed behind because she loved him dearly. You know, he was that answer to prayer. And God blessed her with other children. We don't hear anything about them. I'm sure she loved them just as much, and perhaps she trained them just as diligently. But Samuel was different because she had dedicated him to the distinct service of the Lord. So as I studied these passages, one thing specifically stood out to me. Hannah numbered her days with Samuel, and she applied her heart to wisely teaching him the important basics of life. And we see those results summed up in chapter 3, verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Samuel's love for the Lord only grew stronger. We don't find any place where he thought to himself, I wish I could be like other boys. I wish Mama hadn't trained me to serve in the temple. This is so boring. We don't like that. It says all of Israel knew that he was for that purpose, that God had raised him up to be there in the temple serving. So there was something about him, something about the joy of his worship that they recognized. Um, you know, he didn't stay little. He continued to grow. He was a teenager. By then, he was a young adult. But his love for the Lord only grew. That really impressed me. His birth, his purpose in life, his dedication to God were not by chance or accident. Intentional, specific prayers were answered by God. Intentional, <coughs> focused training was given by Hannah. And then intentional, loving service was rendered by Samuel. All through it, we see that intentional purpose in everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, they knew it wouldn't happen by chance. They had to focus. <coughs> and if we want God to have God, his amazing purpose for each of our children, because I believe each one is wonderfully and creatively made by God. Amen. Then it begins with us being intentional in our loving service to the Lord, in our loving Him personally, feeling God ourselves, and then showing them by example as well as by teaching that they are to love and fear Him too. That we see them from God's perspective. They're not ours to hold on to, they're ours to train for His service, whatever that may be. Um, and it really is a matter of time. You know, we don't know how much time God has given us for them. <coughs> and if we think, you know, we have this moment, <coughs> this moment, let's use it for his glory. And if he gives us the next, we'll use that one for him too. I thought of the old hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. Verse 1 says, Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak, but getting in nothing is blessing to seek. And I believe that's what Hannah did. We see that in Samuel's life. And by God's grace, we can do that too with our children. We can help them to love him so that when, when they're ready to step away from, from home, make their own homes, and what, whatever God calls them to do, they're not wondering, what do I do? You know, this adulting is hard. I see that all the time on Facebook. 
and children are so unprepared for the lives that God created them to, to live. But if we as mothers would do our part and just help them, not to necessarily need us, but to realize their dependence upon God, what a difference it will make. Amen. I do see that she was faithful and that God had asked her to be fruitful and multiply. She did that. And so I look at her and I think the, the mother of all living is Eve. And then there's a part of me that I look at her and I see that she loved her children and she had to watch as one murdered the other one. And what a terrible place that must have been for a mom to be in. But yet she remained faithful even though she failed to what God had called her to do. And uh, the resilience that she had. And then I look at Sarah and uh, how that uh, her and Abraham was destined to be the mother of the nation of Israel. And I know that she, she made mistakes in her life and she was unable to bear a child at, at, at the beginning. But I, I, I look at her and I see that she was a woman even though she tried to help and attempt to, to fix where she felt that God had, had failed, but yet in her old age, she was still faithful to God. You know, we can, we can fail and we can try to fix things and we can make a mess of things. And probably if we'll be really honest with ourselves, a lot of us have, and mom, maybe some of you have, but the message that, hey, uh, that, that Sarah gives is that we have to be faithful even when we make mistakes. Amen. And then I look at Hannah, Sister Rachel talks so wonderfully about her, and I loved how she brought us into numbering our days. It's hard to believe that here in just a couple months our girls are going to be five years old, and I'm not really sure where the past five years have gone. It's been challenging, I'm not going to lie to you. It's challenging between diapers and bottles and sicknesses and meeting needs, and just, it's, it's challenging. But yet, I don't want all the challenges to override the fact that I want to number the, the days that we have. Because, Sister Rachel, you're right. One day, they're not going to want that back scratch. And one day, they're not going to want that snuggling in bed. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a fresh reminder that in the middle of it all, one more story. Uh, just to be able to show them our love. Because... You know, in, in a world that is so mixed up, the Word of God says in the book of Psalms, chapter number 127, except the Lord build the house, they that labor, they labor in vain that build it, except the Lord keep the city and the watchman watcheth, but in vain. Amen. If God doesn't build the house, it's all in vain. We can buy a lot of things for our children. And I was reading as I was preparing for this morning, I was reading and one man said, it's not our presence that they want. They want our presence. Amen. And so just being able to be there and be present with our children. And I find that that, that is what uh, 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 Sarah did. Now look at Jochebed. And I believe as well, Sister Rachel, she had to number her days. Because God had told her that, uh, that or the, the government had called, told her that her son was to be killed. But she went by the David against even civil things. And she did what was right in her own heart. And she, she kept that little boy and she hid him until the day came where she prepared a basket for him. And then we know the story of Miriam. And she was the mother of Aaron as well. That, that Miriam goes and she looks and God works that that she's able to be the nursemaid to her own son. But God had a bigger plan. Do you know God has a big plan for your children's lives? Amen. It may not be the plan that you want or the plan that you like, but allowing them to be who God wants them to be. If there's one thing about being a father that I've learned is 
that both my girls are different, but different is okay because it's who God made them to be. And one day when God says, I want them to go in this direction, then I've given it to God already and, and I place a dedication, then I want to surrender them to God that whatever they want, God has a big purpose for them. And I look at Hannah, I look at her life, and I realize that, that Hannah did only have that little bit of time. But there was something that I was thinking about about Hannah. I ran into some people who shared with me the vulnerabilities of their life, shared with me some, some moments that, that they said that, well, I had a child, but I gave it up for adoption. And I think how beautiful and wonderful that must be if they realize that they're not in a place. And, and I don't know the logistics. I don't ask questions. But I think but God gives a chance to live again. Hannah had other children. Amen. And what a beautiful gift that that is. I look at Bathsheba, her very name, Bathsheba. David sees her, and he sees her taking a bath, and he falls in, in, in love with her, and his lust overtakes him. And we know that they conceive, and we know how that her, her husband was killed uh, in battle. David had arranged all that, and they watched as that little baby dies. But I also see something about a woman that's resilient. I see a woman that God says, but you can live. And he gives her a son named Solomon, who has all the wisdom that anyone could ever want. And this is the amazing part, ladies. And this is for men, too. And we find that this woman, Bathsheba, becomes one of the few women that her name is written in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Because God gives grace and God gives mercy even when we make mistakes. I think parenting is probably full of that. I've had to tell my girls more than one, one occasion that I'm sorry. And I'm sure that parents, you've, moms, you've done that. But realizing that God's amazing grace in this journey. Amen. And God has a great place for us when we remain faithful. The other mother that I was thinking of this morning was a Shunammite woman. I remember her, Elisha came by her house. She made a room on her house for him. And with his servant Gehazi, they were talking. He said, how can we ever repay this woman back? She didn't have any children. And so Elisha called her in and told her, this season is not a lie. You're going to have a baby boy. Don't joke with me, she said. But we know that it wasn't a joke. It was the faithfulness of God. Many years down the line, he became sick and he died. When she came, she came to the presence of where Elisha was. How's your family? It is well. I want to tell you that there's one thing that we can trust our families to, and that's the presence of God, that it will be well. Listen, I wish that there was this answer for everything, and I know there is in the Word of God. Sometimes we have to diligently search it. Sometimes we really have to pray for it because it comes quickly. But there's one thing that we can know is that when we're doing our best to raise our children to serve God, that our families can be well. Amen. Our families can be well. I want a family that's well. I want you to have a family that's well. I want this church to be full of families that are well because our confidence isn't in our circumstances. Our confidence is in the God who blessed us. The Bible says that children are inherited and heritage from the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is His reward. If they're a heritage, if they are a blessing. In a world where some <coughs> folks feel like children are a curse or children are a burden, God says differently. God says that they are a blessing. So realizing that they are a blessing and realizing that when we trust them to God, that God is going to allow all to be well. Amen. I just want to encourage us, moms today, but dads today, families today. Amen. It can be well. I know that we live in a world that is so mixed up. I read uh, this week of uh, President, uh, Vice President Pence speaking at, at Liberty and then speaking at another college. He was talking about that at Liberty, he said, beware of, 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 of the liberalness. We know that uh, in, a, in a conservative Christian school where they're taught those godly values, uh, he, he warned 
that we live in a world where there's not the same values. There's not the sanctity of life. There's not the value of marriage. There's not the value of wholeness of family. God still values that more important than anything else. More important than our jobs. More important than any type of leisure that we can have. God values family. Amen. <coughs> and so God values souls. And souls are part of families. And so for us as believers, we've got to value the family and the family structure. The church is where it starts. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having your families here. Thank you for doing it God's way. And so, then I look at Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I'll close with this. I see the time. But I see that when everybody else was on the cross, she was still there. She went through the ridicule of being with child before she was married, but she knew that God had a plan for that child's life. Listen to every parent that's in here, whether your parent or your child is at home or whether your child is grown up, would you know that God has a plan for your child's life? And when everybody else is gone, I encourage you to be there. Mary was still at the cross when everyone else had been scattered like sheep without a shepherd. But she was there because she believed and she knew. We've got to pray. We've got to believe. It doesn't mean that we approve of sin. We don't approve of sin. But we're there. We trust and we believe. And we know all is well when God is in control. Hallelujah. Sister Rachel, thank you. I'm not a mom. But I'm a dad. It reminds me that i got to remember my days. Amen. That i got to know the value. I may not be here forever. They're going to grow up. They're going to be gone. And so the value of today is more valuable than anything else in spending time. Would you stand with me this morning? I promise I'm going to wrap things up. <clears throat> I've spoken, Sister Rachel's spoken to moms and to dads. I've tried to conclude things by speaking to parents in general. Would you, every parent that's here right now, would you close your eyes? And would you just lift up your hands and say, God, these children are yours. 